Thanks for joining me, Caitlin. This is going to be a great session. Uh, I get a lot of questions about the CSDM and ITSM products, and, and I know you've done, been doing a lot in your space. Um, yeah, so just for the folks here, uh, I'm Mark Bodman. I'm the CSDM Outbound Product Manager. Uh, and uh, Caitlin, uh, what's your title? What's your, what do you do these days? Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. Um, I am the Product Manager for the digital portfolio management product, as well as service portfolio management and service builder. So we have a lot yeah, of ties is, with the CSDM. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of ties. And, and you know, I, I I remember when I when I was first kind of meeting with you and, and getting to know what you were doing here back when I was uh, in a room with David Thigpen, you came in and we were kind of brainstorming this whole DPM idea. And uh, I'm glad you took up the ball and delivered that. It's It's been pretty... I think impactful for our customers. Yeah, we're getting a lot of good interest there and um, a lot of good feedback on how we can continue to evolve it. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that because it does bring that planning development side of the house, you know, with the app owners together with the service owners and you, you're able to see that business app and the, the services together, right? Technical or our business. Uh, so that's, yeah, you, you got two, I, I call it the both sides of the same coin is how I, I like to think about it. Exactly. Everything's so intertwined. And so it doesn't really make sense to, to keep them separate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. So we will do something on that topic at some point, but uh, today I, I'd like to talk a little about some of the advanced use cases and service builder, because a lot of folks don't know about service builder but it's very powerful. You came out with that earlier this year from my recollection. Yeah, it was, um, it was later maybe. last year, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. pretty new. It's pretty new. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like a one you don't have a lot of iterations on it yet, but I think you're getting a lot of feedback. That's right. We, we've been getting some good feedback and it's built using um, a kind of a shared framework. And so there have been some enhancements um, you know, through that shared componentry, so to speak. So one of the things that was recently added, I believe in Tokyo, was the ability to actually uh, modify what we ship. So customers can now add their own fields, change the flow, um, edit the content that's in there, um, and, you know, even add additional steps if, if necessary. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Cause customers are always asking if they can configure things. And that's, uh, that's definitely in keeping with what we've been telling customers for a long time. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we jump into service builder, I wanted to just take folks through the CSDM context, because I think one of the things you do in service builder is that you, you, you start out with, are you creating a, a technical service versus a business service? Um, and you know, you go on from there, right? Is it a business consumer you're dealing with or a technology consumer? And then, uh, you have two different paths. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And then they, they, they create the service records in those dedicated business and technical tables that was yeah. introduced with CSDM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's something we did a couple of uh, releases ago as we created separate tables for business and technical services, because I think traditionally we had everything jammed in one service table and mm -hmm. it was really confusing for folks. So um, now the technical service has its own table and the business service has its own table. And so does the app service, which is in the middle that they're all distinct now. Yes, exactly. And so we do focus on those dedicated tables, which I think does confuse some customers that um, the any existing service in the base table, the CMDB CI service table, isn't you know being shown in Service Builder or having the option to edit or or create into that table, and that was intentional because um, we do okay. want to move forward and and be aligned with where you're going with CSDM and have those clear delineations so we can okay. start to further evolve those records and experiences to be tailored to the types. Now, if they do have a lot of records in the base service table mm -hmm. and they want to use service builder, what would you recommend they do? Do they, do they re-implement or do they change the class or how, how should they get there? We did provide a migration tool in Tokyo. Um, it's in the, it's, it's added as an action within the base service table. You, you can learn about it 
through our product docs and like re release notes yeah. updates there. So we do have that migration. If, if you feel good about the services you have and how they're defined and how you've shaped your offerings and, you know, connected those to the app services, then it, it does make sense. I think to do more of a straight migration, if mm -hmm. you um, are not happy with the services that you've defined, meaning maybe you have duplicates or um, they're not really thoroughly vetted. It's a good opportunity to kind of clean house, so to speak. So yeah. instead of porting everything over, you could take some time and actually work through what you have and yeah. be a little bit more strategic about what you create in those tables. Yeah. Cause, cause, cause what I find is a lot of times they're created without the service owner involved. It's almost like somebody that was setting up the help desk went out there and just kind of guessed at what the services should be maybe, or, or based it on the cues of folks working and that's pretty much it or reporting requirements, but the service owner was sort of out of the picture. So they mm -hmm. didn't provide a lot of these other details you really need to know in order to understand the context, like how is it used in the catalog or how is it connected to CIs or app services or anything like that? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And so the service builder is intended to get the service owner and the service delivery teams a lot more engaged in that service creation and management process, you know, continuing to update and enhance what's defined in those records. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that, that is kind of a, in concert with what I've been telling customers too on the CSDM conversations, because uh, they, they just don't know what's really in there and they can really appreciate all this other data that's available. And, and also the use of things like subscriptions. I often talk about, uh, you can actually have a location as a subscriber or a user or a group. Uh, or even a department. So, uh, you know, this this is a powerful little thing that not enough customers are really ex leveraging effectively is what I find. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, you know, a lot of feedback we've gotten. And, and one of the reasons we actually did create the, the digital portfolio management product is a lot of the service owners aren't in service now because it's not a very friendly tool for them. And so yeah. they have their services much more completely defined in different kinds of tools like a OneNote or a SharePoint or mm -hmm. an Excel. And so that data that you're talking about, um, they might know that um, inherently or they have it documented in um, you know, one of those tools or places, but it's not operationalized in ServiceNow. Yeah. And there's so much that you can do once, once you do get that hooked up into ServiceNow. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like empower the service owner and let them see everything associated with those services. Uh, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so so uh, the one thing that I get a lot of questions on and I, I, I just wanna make sure we're in sync on some of this stuff and maybe there's some opportunities to extend is, is really the difference between the technical and the business services and you have different consumers. And, and I wanna walk through how we, how we tell customers what the difference is and, and maybe talk a little bit about you know, what we do currently and what we could do in the future. We've talked about maybe streamlining how to define things like the dynamic CI group, which connects us to the infrastructure down here. But uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to go through that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So when yeah. I talk to, I mean, and I'll just say, I use your definitions within the CSDM when I'm talking to customers. That way we're using the same um, sources of data and trying to be consistent with that message. That yeah. being said, right now, the way that we created those dedicated tables is we really just extended from the base service table and the records weren't tailored, I would say, like the views. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what we kind of started with is, okay, we'll keep them consistent. We're going to put them in their dedicated tables and then we can continue to evolve what is on those views, like which, which fields we recommend filling out, how we can uh, better define those entities as what they're intended to support. So when I talk to customers about technical services, um, what, we're, what we're exploring there is to say that they should be created to manage or provide the support for an application service. And you know, it, it's not end user facing, it's it's much more something that's leveraged, you know, potentially by other service owners or other services, um, you know, really to provide that that level of support. So you could define um, your SLAs there, your availability there. Um, you create that relationship between the dynamic CI group or the application service. 
And you really get more into that like operational, you know, technical side of things from the yeah. business service perspective. And I think this is maybe where um, it, it's, I think, more difficult because a lot of the customers that I talk to, they're providing their services to employees or to the business or to end users. Um, and the way that they're talking about them and the way that we would like them to, to be defined and managed is like it's something that you would um, you know, be selling externally. So you want it to be mm. end user facing. You want it to make sense to that particular user. You want to think about what value that they're getting out of it, what um, things they might need to request to get help with it, um, how an outage related to that particular offering or service you know, really does impact the business. And so mm -hmm. that's how we are talking about that. So it's, it's really kind of who it's for and the fact that a lot of times it's dependent on those other technical service offerings in order to, yeah. to work. Yeah, I, I often talk about this is sort of your last mile. Your, your technology consumers are pretty much like teams that are, you know, ordering infrastructure, database services, and they are standing up databases down here individually. Um, and then you've got application service owners and platform service owners who are also providing those technology services for teams to use uh, as building, I call them building blocks in the architecture space. You know, these are technology, shared technology services or building blocks. Um, and, and they need to be requestable largely by teams that are, that are building something, right? Yeah. And they're provided as services more as a layer, like a layer of the infrastructure, network layer, or database layer, or compute layer, whatever, whatever makes sense. Um, and, and, and it all kind of comes through the, the app services where all these piece parts are assembled as a, I like to call this a system, to be honest, because application services are sort of a misnomer and a lot of people don't know what that really means. Um, but when you say it's a system, it's all a combination of all these underlying components that are working together to do something for somebody. That makes a lot more sense. Um, databases, uh, mm -hmm. network devices, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that technology consumer, that, that, that's how I like to explain it. And it, usually you still report if your infrastructure layer is not behaving, you know, you need to manage that expectation, you know, in, in the OLAs or SLAs that are defined in the offering. But, but there's a different team out here that's managing the end mile where the business consumers are and who they are, you know, what location was impacted because of an outage or what business unit or department was, was defected because of an outage, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, so I, I think that we're definitely in, in sync in terms of how we use the definitions and how we... Uh, implement that with our product to support our customer base. I think there's just not enough people that really understand that differentiation between these two. And I think from a product standpoint, we could do a lot more. I think we were, we were talking about this one here the other day, um, this dynamic CI group. Um, in, in the CMDB, when I go to customers now, I often tell them that you need two people in the room to, to define a technology service here right now, because you need somebody that understands the CI, CMDB really well. You need to understand you know, what CI type is really my, my service. If I own the infrastructure services for networking, for example, I have to know where the networking stuff is so that I can define that as part of my service. It's related to my offering. Um, what I find is you have to have two people in the room. <laughs> One is your service owner that can describe it in human terms. They know basically the devices that they, they own and how to characterize, you know, different SLAs, OLAs, right? Some are maybe development environments, some are production environments or whatever. Uh, so they could define the different SLAs, but then they have to connect to something in the CMDB. And, and that's where you have the ha second person that, that with that knowledge has to be involved. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up too, because one of the things that we, we wanted to do with the service builder is enable teams to collaborate on how a service is defined and, and the relationships that are mapped around it. Because just like you said, there are so many different people that I think have to come into play to get 
all these decisions made, for example, like for certain types of services, you may need input from legal, you know, you may need policy work done, you potentially you'll need to talk to, you know, the marketing teams, how you're going to roll this out, or how you're going to train your support group. So a lot of um, people and different functions come into play. So what we wanted to do with a service builder is to allow users to to basically create and then continue to save draft versions so yeah. you don't actually have to publish it until you're ready so um, if you have those two people in the room who can can fully define this together at the same time that's awesome and then if you are working remotely or if asynchronously the other thing is you can have you know that individual go into the builder and, and kind of add those those relationships ideally and, yeah. and, you know, slowly build it out over time with our traditional records, right? You, you, you enter data into a couple of fields and then you have to save it and then it's available right. for everyone. That's so, right. yeah. Yeah. I noticed that you can, you can put it as part of a workflow even and get it approved. So the, the life cycles, I guess you've, you've started to really leverage the life cycles more in terms of um, you know, it's an idea to maybe a draft version versus, you know, during the approval process and build process, and then eventually it becomes operational, you know, very similar to how we think about the CIs down here. Uh, so you're, you're following that same life cycle approach, right, is, is really the idea? Exactly, exactly. Kind of creating that almost a scratch pad. So yeah. things can change, you're, you don't have to commit the exact value for a specific field right now, you know, and yeah. we also wanted to hold back the business rules. So if you mm. haven't entered a, a required field, or if you haven't added a specific relationship that may be required, you know, within your organization, we won't actually run any of those business rules until you click submit or save, like right. to, to publish that service. That way, again, you can be, it can evolve and, and you can iterate on it. That's cool. That's cool. And yeah. so it doesn't have to show up in incident management yet because it's not quite done yet. Right. So all, exactly. these, all these processes are, are really looking at that life cycle and paying attention. Yeah. So to exactly. Speak. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. And, and I do find that some customers, they, as they're defining these services, they get, they, they basically flesh this part out, but then they got to, to do the next. It doesn't exist yet. That's where they have to get the other people involved or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to create the app service that doesn't exist yet to connect or even the catalog item because, you know, that doesn't exist yet either. So, yes. Um, yeah. Right now it's really just linking things that already do exist. And so that is yeah. one place that we want to improve. How can we enable either like, um, creating a request for someone to create something on your behalf if you don't have the right role or permission to do that yourself or um, actually be able to create something, you know? So That's right. one, one thing that we are doing is we're working with the catalog builder team to create a closer kind of relationship between the service builder and catalog builder experiences so that nice. if yeah. So if a catalog item doesn't exist yet, um, and this persona can also create catalog items, then they could actually go and do that. Or they could potentially, again, create a request for someone to create that for them. We want to build out some of those use cases. That's awesome. Because I'm what we're seeing is a big shift towards product centricity and teams. You know, one team owns everything. It's like they should be responsible for not only defining the service that they own, but also the catalog item and how it's exposed and maybe the, the app service and how that relates down here. So one team sort of has different positions and they all have a, they, they're all working on the same sort of deliverable, if you will, but they they all have different roles or maybe what, in a really small organization might be one person that just owns everything right. and they have permissions to do everything. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a, it's great news to hear that. And I, uh, I, I do think also this last mile is quite interesting and in, in what I'd like to understand it, what you're seeing in terms of picking up subscribers, because uh, I think it's a really super powerful when, when a server goes down here and you know the app service that that uses it or multiple, there could be multiple services that, that use it. Uh, and then you understand the offering, of course, service here from metrics perspective, but then I think the, the real power is understanding, oh, the, everybody in this location is down because this is a critical server that let's say 
uh, provides networking capability for everybody in the office or, you know, networking gears down or uh, a specific set of users or even a business unit like HR can't do their job because the HR system is impact, uh, impacted by a, a server failure that runs that, that software. So, uh, but what, so that subscriber is sort of that, that hidden little thing I think is super powerful but it's just underutilized in my opinion. And I, I'd like to get your take. Cause I think if you, if, as people come on board the organization or if uh, the request process is tied in and you're able to you know, establish who the subscribers are when they request stuff, uh, it, it becomes so much more useful in change or incident processes. Um, what, what, what are you seeing out there? What do you think about this whole capability? Yeah, I have, I absolutely agree. I, I do think it is quite underutilized. Um, and I, I think that there's a ton of value in it. So the, like you said, what we do is we give different ways that you can associate users to an offering. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do that, like you said, by location or by group, individual user, um, or things like, you know, the, the company or the department. And so what yeah. you can do is you ideally have these things set up through, um, you know, having your users pulled maybe through an integration that, that's managing all, all of your users, but you you have your users in the, just the, that base um, sys user table. And then when a user is added to, let's just say a group, for example, when you associate that group to the offering, that user is then associated to the offering. And so you have yeah. that line of visibility where you know the number, but then you can also see the actual individual people. And yeah. one of the ways that we suggest thinking about how you can differentiate your offerings is who has access or who is leveraging this particular thing. Like who, who have you created this for? So yeah. if it's like you said, for a particular location, then you can see all the people that are allocated to that location are currently being impacted. It can help you get better clarity around the level of impact. Um, Cause not just based on what the business criticality is, but the number of people or the type of people who are, who are being impacted. Yeah. I, I think it's so, so important. And one of the things that I've, I've experimented with is, you know, asking the service owner, who are your consumers? Who, who consumes this and how can we define that in terms of this information down here? Right. It's, is it, a, is it everybody in a department? Is it a specific small set of users that you're tracking or users in a group? Uh, and, and when you do that, you're able to gather that information at the time of creation or, or manage it as it changes, right? Or say, let's tie it in with this integration source, which provides that detail. Uh, how do we, you know, so they have a, an active picture every day, who's consuming their stuff. And then, you, of course, that feedback loop can kick in and you can ask them, you know, how are things going? Does this work? You know who, you know who's using your stuff. That's that's really critical. Yeah, that's a good point. Definitely the feedback loop. Um, you you know who's using it, so you can request feedback. Or if you're looking at different ways to enhance or innovate on what you're providing, that's a great place to go to to get input and and learn what is needed or what is desired. And then yeah. um, one other thing is you can you can use these today to to link. Or, or to, I guess I, I should say, to determine access to catalog items. So mm -hmm. that's also a way that you can kind of connect those two worlds. So based on the users that are linked to your offering, um, you can you know define or, or use that to say which users can actually see and then either let them subscribe yes. to, to your offering. You could use that as a yeah. mechanism to get subscribers or request a particular service. Um, or you can um, use that to allow those dedicated users to get help with certain items. Yeah. Well, and I've talked to customers who, you know, if they do this well, when this user comes back, whoever that individual is, you already know they're in the system. They're part of the group or they're individually uh, subscribing to that service. You could say, here are the list of things that you're subscribed to. What are you calling about? You know, it, right. it's, it's like when you go to the phone company to pay a bill well, which phone or change your phone? You might have two or three phones in your family. Which ones you're talking about? It, you know, they know who you are. They're billing you. They, you have a portal to come in and ask for help or to change your phone or discontinue service or whatever. Exactly. There was a really cool use case um, that was by a city 
where they mm -hmm. use the catalog item and then the subscribers where if one of their um, constituents in the city reported an issue via the, mm -hmm. the catalog, they could say, you know, maybe there's a light out on my street. And so I, you know, we need to have the, the light bulb updated. So they request that. And by doing so, that will actually subscribe them to the offering so that they can get updates about the progress of that of that work being done. And then, nice. um, yeah, so they, they kind of tied it to, they created a flow to, uh, um, to subscribe them and then also to give them targeted updates on the progress. And then once that was closed, they then would um, unsubscribe them from that offering. So now they will no longer be getting those updates. Okay. So it was a really great use case. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that kind of ex exhausts a lot of the, I would say, interesting things here. The only other thing I can think about is I know we also put technical service in there as part of the portfolio and we do have these KPIs that can roll up, you know, into the, into the service um, business or technical and then to the portfolio. Uh, just a little bit of sidebar on that one, because I do have a lot of customers that want to set up this portfolio structure. And we have these enterprise portfolios now in DPM. Is that the same as service portfolio? Is that something different? Uh, can you exactly. maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And that is a point of confusion. It The enterprise portfolio is right now the service portfolio. The reason we called it enterprise was because we want to build that out to allow customers to create different kinds of portfolios. The, the main idea around the enterprise portfolio is basically its relationship to the personal portfolio. So within DPM, we have these two different portfolios. Personal is something that you yourself as an, an individual user can log in and you can create a portfolio. It's flat. You can put anything you want in there, business applications, services, offerings, application services, dyna dynamic CI groups, and you manage that or, or you, you think about those things as, as what you care about and what you want to know about. You can create right. as many as you want, and it's really just for you. The enterprise portfolio is something that the organization says, this is how we think about what we are providing. It's, right. it's, and it's usually built with an intention. So it's either like, how do we roll up finances or how do we organize things based on levels of ownership and responsibility, or how do we organize these to do reporting? Okay. So right now it's just looking at the service portfolio, but one thing we keep getting requests from and something that's, that's been added to our roadmap is to allow customers to create flexible business application portfolios. Just like what you were talking about, so many organi organizations are team oriented. So what within the APM space, there are structured portfolios that already exist. What customers right. want to do is say, hey, I want to I want to create a portfolio where I can just roll up specific metrics that I that we need to report on. Um, mm -hmm. Or I want to create um, a portfolio based on my team and organization structure and hierarchy. So I can see how my teams and then groups of teams are performing for their apps. So right. those, that kind of flexibility. So it's something that we're doing, but like you said, right now, it's just looking at the service portfolio. Got it. So we got, we got big plans for this. So watch for, I would say additional functionality in DPM and, and we'll have to do a whole separate section on that because uh, yeah, that, that's, that is getting a lot of attention. I, I talk to customers all the time and they, the ones that look at it, they love it. Awesome. That's always good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that kind of rounds out most of my questions on this slide. Is there any anything here from a CSDM perspective that you'd like to to ask me about that you might have questions about on or um, pretty much straightforward? You know, I think this was really straightforward. I think like in the future, it would be so nice to to really hash out or sit down and and kind of create those dedicated record views for the technical mm -hmm. versus the business service yeah. and offerings. Yeah. Cause even though the offerings live in the same table, that's really where our definitions come into play. Like real, the differentiation between um, how you're pro providing or delivering on something is at the offering level. 
So yeah. it would be so nice to talk through like how we can, we can better dedicate those views. I think that'd be great. And I'm starting to see customers really demand that, right? They want to be able to, you know, get these guys work with the, the guys that own the app service mapping process or define the app service mapping parameters mm-hmm. that get fit in, fit into it. Uh, for example, if I know it's a platform type of app that I own, you know, there should be some parameters that send into the uh, the, the process to define this thing as a platform or mm-hmm. infrastructure, which infrastructure is it networking thing to define the query automatically as part of the dynamic CI group. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, close the gap there. I, I 100% agree. That would be great. And I think we're starting to see the you know, convergence of these user experiences to kind of come together. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the cool thing is that we have this natural language query capability we added uh, just recently in, in, uh, in, in the Tokyo release uh, and just before that as a, a pre, uh, early access. But now we can define that query by just saying, you know, all the server, you could just say in English, give me all the server CIs in this data, in this uh, IP range and, and provide the IP range. And it provides, it generates the query for you and you can just execute it. You can plop it in this dynamic state group and you're off to the races. So uh, yeah, that's a real game changer. Yeah. You don't have to be an expert on the CMDB CI structures and all that. You can kind of describe it. And if you, and if you do need help, it pops you into the CMDB query builder, which is a nice UI that says, okay, here's what I'm querying across these two or three objects. What are the filter criteria and, what are the relationships between them? So anyways, there's there's a nice experience there that I, I'll put a link in, in here on how to learn about that. Cool. Um, okay, well, I, I can't think of anything else here. The one thing I wanted, I did wanna highlight, which is coming soon, uh, probably in the Vancouver release, is that we, we do have the ability to bring information in around CMDB from multiple sources. Like if you have SCCM or Discovery or other sources, we can basically bring that in through the IRE and reconcile. If you have three sources for a server, for example, we can reconcile that. We're extending that capability to other non-CMDB records. So if you have, for example, multiple sources for user information, Active Directory and and HR systems like Workday, you can now do, you leverage IRE for that and, and set up rules on what to use from each source and how they merge into one user record or one location record or one organizational hierarchy. So that's something we're extending some of our functionality to manage data outside just traditional CIs. That's really nice. Yeah, uh, customers do struggle with that. It's a very similar use case as CMDB, but uh, when it comes to this information, they have locations from different sources or you know company records from a financial system, but then they also have something in active directory uh, that they would like to use. So anyways, this this helps to bring all that data together. And now there are no excuses for not using subscribers. <laughs> that's right, that's right. No, no, that's a, that's a perfect point. The subscriber information could easily be brought in and, and referenced, you know, if it's all there. And it's funny, I do, part of the, 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 the approach we take now, the governance, the, the way we say, here's how you apply CSDM is, you know, start with that foundation data. You should get the people right, get the locations right, organizational hierarchy right. Assuming you did that, when you get to crawl and walk and you're defining those technical and business services, you're you're ready to relate them to that core data. You know, it's all there. Exactly. Um, that's That would be an ideal situation. I think we can get our customers there. Uh, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's light at the end of the tunnel. I love it. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, I th- that's pretty much all I wanted to cover on the slide where I can bring up an instance and go through, just want to walk through Service Builder a little bit. So this is my instance here, my demo instance and Service Builder, that's available in the store, right? I just want to clarify that there's no charge because um, it might be misleading in the store where it does say it's part of SPM, but I, so I got questions on that. That's right. It's, it's available in the store. As long as you have an ITSM standard SKU, you're mm-hmm. good. It's available. Okay. It's not extra fees. All right. Well, now that that's clear, everybody can go download it and I'll provide a link in the description here so people can grab it right from the store. If you don't have privileges, you go work with your 
platform administrators and they can get that going for you. Yep. And uh, so this is, you know, how do you get to it? Just look for service builder and it's its own workspace, right? It's kind of its own little workspace. Exactly. Yes. So this is kind of what I was talking about where we are kind of sh sharing this componentry. So if you're familiar with the catalog builder, it's yeah. very, very similar. Okay. And that's why you're going to be able to co collaborate with the catalog folks because it's all the same building blocks can be now mixed and matched and merged together in new workspaces. Is that right? That's right. And one of their key target use users for the uh, catalog builder were, were service owners or service teams. So being able to okay. empower teams to create their own catalog items, because traditionally, I guess nice. it's really complicated. So it fits really nicely. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, here you got the two different paths highlighted, creating a business versus the technical services. And you can see these are the ones that I've already created. And they're in different states in terms of the life cycle. So I've got one in draft mode and I got one already published. Um, horrible name, right? But hey, this is a demo. Um, I'm gonna create, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to create a business service just to kind of walk through one. And what I really like about this and how I, what I really hype to my customers is it's not only the process of creating this thing, but you're learning what this stuff means and, and sort of what you got to think about or, or consider in the process of defining it. And I, and I love that about what you, what you got here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. I think a lot of times when you look at just our lists and forms, it, you can't get the whole picture. It, it's impossible yeah. to see it, especially because a service is, is really the sum of its parts and it has a lot yeah. of different parts. So we yes. try to bring that together. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and I like this where you kind of outline on the left, all the major topics you got to consider here. And, and the cool thing is on the right, you've got this assistance right along the way. Uh, to kind of give you some suggestions and pointers and things like that. And then you got further help, which is like right here embedded in each of the attributes where you can hover over this little exclamation point and see even more detail. I love this. Yeah, one thing, one piece of feedback we were getting, especially from customers who are interested in service portfolio management, what were as about like, how are these fields used? So mm. there's a, a lot of times concern or um, maybe concerns the wrong word, but if, if a field were to be used in a way that isn't in alignment with what it was intended and potentially breaking something or causing up or downstream Im impacts. And what we wanted to yeah. do is we wanted to try to give it a description of what it is and how it's used. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that because that's where CSDM got created. I mean, I remember we were in a room in knowledge 17 and I represented the at, the, at the time, ITBM portfolio, uh, it's now SPM. And then I had an ITM counterpart. We had an ITM counterpart. So all these people from different areas of the organization all knew we didn't have a common way of defining even the tables we were talking about and let alone the attributes at this level. So uh, I'm really glad that, that this has come around to this level of detail. Yeah, I think it's a, it's um, a huge step in the right direction. Yeah. And so here's the, the life cycle phase and status. These are the ones that we, of course, defined in the, in the, uh, the new ones the, as part of the CSDM effort. Uh, so you're supporting that natively, which is great. And by the way, just to let folks know, you can't customize these life cycles. So yeah, it, you can, but what we're looking at is more automation around changing these or using these in processes. So as, as, as Caitlin highlighted earlier, you're leveraging this to down this downstream here to be able to show up in certain forms like incident management or whatnot. So uh, we don't want, if you add something, we won't know how to process it in those forms. It just, you have to change the logic there too. Yeah. Um, okay, and so, so you got through, you know, these different sections down the business case, which is great. You, you've got the, the team dynamics and these are where if you don't have the people or group set up, you really, you know, what do you do? <laughs> you know, yeah. so you got the individual folks, uh, and I and I do I do see folks asking about vendors, or and I notice that you can set a vendor at a, at a service level or at the offering level. So if you have a vendor provider that's uh, going to provide that service, is that the intent here? Really, is uh, making sure you have traceability and you can pretty much go to that vendor if you have an incident, for example, on that service. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So sometimes you'll have different vendors who are enabling different offerings. So we wanted to give yeah. the flexibility to define it at both the service and the offering level, depending on, on what you need. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. 
And then you get into the performance, which uh, basically are KPIs, and you have to set that up, right? I think this is one of those things where you got to think about your KPIs, but you give everybody some suggestions um, on the kind of KPIs that, that make sense um, and that we can provide if you have incident management or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this is also tied with the digital portfolio management. So within mm. DPM, we'll surface these metrics. So the way that it works is you can, if you've associated this service with a portfolio that, and that portfolio has an associated uh, KPI group, what you can do then is that that service will inherit those particular KPIs because those are the, the metrics that potentially the organization wants to track at each level and, and report out at a, at a higher level. And then you can also tailor metrics to a specific service or even a specific offering. So you can start with more macro metrics that are applicable. And then that way also you don't have to assign metrics to every single service or offering. We do have some of that inheritance kind of built in. And then we surface nice. those in DPM and we, we give you that roll up reporting and we also give you a breakdown. So you can see where the numbers are coming from with regards to the, the nodes of your portfolio or the services and offerings. Yeah, we're definitely gonna have to do a separate session on DPM alone. That, that is, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot there. that We, we just can't cover all here, but uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, yes, absolutely. But but it all comes from here, right? Like you said, if you don't define them at the service level, you have nothing to propagate up, right? You have to have them defined somewhere. Yep. And then you go into the offerings. I'll get a lot of customers that don't really um, think about this. And what did I miss here? Warning, complete step one. What did I not do? Oh, details, I've got to give it a name, ha ha. <laughs> All right, uh, and now I can go to the offerings and you're saying, now you're tracking this as I build it, right, in the background, but it's not, you know, ready for prime time. It's just being stored and I can workflow everything later if I want to, is that right? Exactly, so this is where that draft and published comes into play. Um, yeah. On the re review and submit page, there's a yeah. button where once you hit that submit button, that's when you publish it. Um, but until you do that, everything's in draft. So it's not like visible to any other processes. Again, this yeah. is where you can just put in a placeholder name and you can come back and you can add that later, or you can see, okay, I need to, you know, identify who the users are going to be. You can kind of use this as yeah. a template and fill it out over time. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Um, so let's go back because I didn't define any offerings yet. I think this is where the meat of everything kind of happens at the offering level. That's right. And, and, what I, and what I suggest to customers is that they define at least one offering. Um, mm -hmm. Well, they have to really they define a lot of this stuff that's meaningful. Uh, that was weird. Um, consumer type. So you have a lot of the same information about uh, the service, but a little bit more detail. Describe the offering uh, prerequisites for this, if there are anything. Um, team here. This, this is where you also you get into the same kind of team levels. Now, now how does that work from a team perspective? I, I notice a lot of the same information is here. I, I guess, so somebody can own the service overall, but you have, may have different owners for the offerings. Is that right? Or different That's right. Managers. Exactly. So what we actually did was we, we created um, a couple of rules where we will automatically populate these fields with whatever you've defined at the service level to just try to remove some of that like duplicative work. Um, yeah. But they can obviously be updated if the owner or the delivery manager or the vendor, you know, is different. So Got that it. was one of the things that we tried to do to, to remove some of the repetitive um, nice. Yeah. So, so you're, it's like you're pre-filling the forms at this level because you've formed it already in the service level. So. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and then uh, one thing, is, one thing too, to call out, it's like a little bit of a tip is if you have multiple offerings that are similar, what yeah. we suggest is you create one and you try to put as much of the details possible in there and then you can duplicate it. And then you just ah. update it. So that way, again, you're not having to type in and do all that repetitive work over and over again. Yeah. So I we can go through that when we come back to that original page. 
Very cool. I like that. So if the only thing different is maybe the delivery manager, right? Because it's a different team or whatever, uh, different location, who knows, right? But that's the only difference. Everything else can be the same. You just go and change the delivery manager and you're done with the second one. Exactly. Exactly. Because a lot of times we hear like, well, it's pretty much the same, but we have different SLAs or we have a different availability commitment or there's a different price associated with it. You know, those kinds of things where it's really the same except for these specific areas. And so instead of, yeah, having to do it over and over again, we try to make yeah. it easier. Yeah. Okay. And now we're getting into the meat. I think you mentioned some of these already and we talked about subscribers, but this is where you select or relate those specific subscribers, like a, a location. This would be your location hierarchy, everybody in Boston or in a specific uh, uh, street address. <laughs> you know, So this is a whole, this could be a whole hierarchy of locations that are aligned to the way you do business and um, uh, you can kind of put all that in there and there, and you can miss, I, I noticed you can mi mix match these things uh, just to kind of put in, you know, here are the users, locations, departments, groups, and so on all together. Yeah, exactly. And so as long as you have users that are associated to the group or the department or the location, we then also will give you those subscriber counts um, nice. You can see them on the records, but then you also see it in DPM. That's that's beautiful. So if you know that everybody in Boston, for example, I think that was one of my choices, Boston, you, you can go and look at all the folks that are deployed to Boston and say, okay, here, here's the, the 1500 people we have in the Boston area, they can all be infected. Exactly. And so then if there's an outage and it's impacting that particular offering, all the folks in Boston, you can then also kind of get a sense of, okay, we have I forget the number that you said, Mark, but that number of people are currently unable to do X, Y, and Z. So nice. it can also help you understand impact. Yeah, because a lot of customers have these weird models where they try to deal with it at the CI server level, and it's just impossible to manage. But this this puts it in the hands of the service owner, right? They define this stuff, and it just works, right? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we have commitments here, uh, kind of like SLA, OLA type stuff, I guess, is, is what this is. And you can have whatever defined commitments and SLA contract. Is, is that basically for contracts from your uh, provider? So if you have a, a vendor and they have a contract, you basically select those contracts. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. And then this can help you like, so whatever might be defined or agreed upon in that contract, then you can extract those service level requirements and you can put it, paste it into that field above and then also yeah. create the, the appropriate commitments um, for that. And then any additional contracts. So this could be contracts that you've had before, but that are no longer, it, it's more for like auditing and historical purposes yeah. Um, yeah. to give you that traceability. What I noticed is that like we have a vendor management capability and it looks like we're doing some uh, work. I don't know if it's out yet is, is to mine the contract for some of the details that we can use in, in here, for example, is, is that, are you tied in with some of those activities in, in product? We're language? not, we're not at this point, um, yeah. but that would be something that we could look into. I wasn't aware of that. And that's really cool because a lot of times yeah there's a lot of language around the service level requirements. And so you want to be able to like have that very easily accessed, you know? So if yeah. you want to put it right here on your offering form, we, you can, and you can form it, um, you can format the text and, and stuff. So it's easily readable. And then you can create the right commitments for your offerings, but it all comes back to that contract. Yeah, agreed. And as, so service integration and management is a big use case that can, we can really start to flesh out here as well uh, to be yeah. much more seamless and automated. Yes, I agree. Nice. We've got the catalog items. You mentioned that earlier. This is where you specify those catalog items. And, and if, of course, it doesn't exist, maybe this is where you can interface with their user experience to create that item. Exactly. So that's one thing that we would love to, to kind of bring together is if you don't have one, well, it would be really great if you could actually go and create one or create a yeah. placeholder in the builder and then come back and, and work on these things simultaneously. So that's something that we're working awesome. on now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Really closing the loop on everything related to this. Um, yes. Uh, and then dependencies depend and, and application services. This is where we start to connect into that ITOM world where we define those app services that are providing this uh, particular service and offering. Yeah. Exactly. And then again, just like you mentioned, 
um, another opportunity here where maybe an application service hasn't been created yet, but so you could maybe create a task, especially if this mm. is a service that's being developed still or designed yeah. even. You can create a task or a request so that the action that's required to build that out is captured and you have that work um, and it's linked then back to this particular record um, yeah. in ServiceNow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. So I, I tell a lot of folks they don't have to learn CSDM anymore. They just go in and follow, follow this process to create the service, the offering and linkages to catalog items and in app services, it's it's just creating that diagram we just walked through a minute ago, right? So uh, yes. without having to think about all of those relationship types and stuff. Exactly. Love it. Um, just a couple more things I want to I want to cover um, financials. Uh, so I, I I like that you have a price. So this is how you expose what price might be exposed to the, your your catalog, right? So like a, a not not really a chargeback, but maybe a showback function. Is that really intent at this point? Yeah, and and it, customers have used this in different ways, uh, and and yeah. some actually have built this out further. So um, this could be a way that you're differentiating something. So one of the and this is actually more of like a technical service, but like you mentioned, like I need to request a new server be stood up, and so yeah. the offering can represent the the different parameters around what kind of a server like the capacity and all that and then also different levels of maintenance or service for that server and then mm. they can define all of those things and so if they do have a model where it is acting like um you know they, they almost like contract with the business then they would say okay business this is how much this would cost if you need yeah. this service from us yeah so this is accounting level this is pretty much just so you can manage the service overall and discuss sort of net pricing, compare and contrast them. Is that right? Exactly. It's like a, a place to document it again, all in the name of, of how the service service offering is, is defined and, and being used. Got it. Uh, and then the last thing is performance, which again, those KPIs. Yeah. So you fill those out. Uh, so saving and closing, and I come back to this screen. I've got the new offering now in the list. So this is what you were saying. You can clone this thing. I didn't know that. So is that something I could do right here? Exactly. So when you select it, then you see up on the top right, it says you could delete or you could duplicate. Oh, nice. So you made it really easy. So I can have all my different offerings here, duplicate them, change the one or two parameters that might be different. And there I am. I'm off to the Exactly. Right. Exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then the last big step in the whole process is, uh, you know, review and submit this. It tells you everything that you've got set up here. Um, and once I submit this, this could go to like a workflow. It could go to, you know, what are the options here that you've seen or what we're playing? Yeah. For? So most of the customers we've spoken with, they would prefer that this go through an approval process. That way yeah. there can be um, just a level of oversight to make sure that the form and fields are being used correctly and that, you know, certain requirements and criteria are met for that organization. And so what this can, what you could do is you can hook this to like a flow designer flow and, and have those approvals in place. And then one thing that we're looking at, it's in our roadmap is to actually create um, an out of the box approval flow and uh, and also kind of create a hook. So it's easier to hook your approval flow just directly to the submit button. Just want to thank you, Caitlin. This has been awesome. I think the, the use of the service builder is critical to implementing CSDM because you just create the model as we prescribed, you know, it follows the, our recipe from a modeling point of view. And of course, uh, you know, service builder follows the best practices and a lot of what's provided in terms of advice to, to get this thing running and uh, integrate more with other processes within our platform. I think this is a really powerful thing. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. This, this was fun. Yeah, same here. We'll, we'll do another one for DPM next. We'll, we'll, slate, we'll schedule that one out next. Thanks. Sounds good. <laughs>